اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم ورحمت اللہ وبرکاتہ I am here to welcome all the attendees to the fourth session of the last day for Solis 2015. The topic for this session is Mindfulness Meditation. The speaker for this session is Brother, Im uh, Brother Rizwan Bhatt. Before I hand over the session to Brother Rizwan, I would like to introduce him to all of you. Brother Rizwan Bhatt is the president of the Eastern Phillipsburg Muslim Association, a member of the outreach committee at the Muslim Association of Lehigh Valley, as well as the Cultural Diversity Committee. He has lived in the Lehigh Valley for the past 14 years and has been involved in the interface dialogue for over 8 years. Although ethnically from Pakistan, Brother Rizwan was born and raised in the Middle Eastern Kingdom of Bahrain before immigrating to America over 20 years ago. He works as a consulting solutions manager at a software company and serves as a volunteer for local mosques. Without further delay, I would like to invite Brother Rizwan to please take the mic and start the session. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Jazakumullah khairan for attending this session and for your continued participation in this uh, magnificent event that we've had uh, over the past few days. Um, may Allah reward all those who have participated in planning it and executing it and those who have attended. May Allah increase us all in beneficial knowledge that we can take away from these sessions and to implement in our lives and to better ourselves as well as our communities. So with that, I'd like to, um, you know, I'll try to keep this um, session simple and, and easy and brief because I'm sure a lot of people have been following the sessions throughout the past few days. I'm sure you're quite uh, overwhelmed with the amount of knowledge and information that you've received and it's good for us to sometimes take a break and assimilate that and try to understand everything that we've uh, absorbed, uh, especially when it comes in such an intense form. So this will be a shorter session inshallah. I'll just cover a few basic points and alhamdulillah some of this is just a reminder for us and in other situations it might be uh, a way to connect the dots in terms of how our deen uh, understand, how we understand the concept of prayer in our deen and, and maybe something interesting at the end that uh, at least for me it blew my mind so inshallah hopefully it will be a positive effect for you as well. So alhamdulillah I'll begin with this hadith from the Prophet ﷺ that was recorded by Imam Ahmed where the Prophet ﷺ is reported to have said that the coolness of my eyes is in the prayer and this is a very profound hadith because as individuals, you know, we all have different inclinations, different desires, different likes and dislikes and so on and so forth. And each of us may have our own way of finding comfort in some activity or some, you know, maybe inactivity or something that we do. But for the Prophet ﷺ, he always went back to the prayer. And this is something that we need to internalize in our lives too, is that when we get stressed out, when we go through difficulties, Perhaps we as well should look as prayer as an avenue to overcome some of our own challenges that we go through and that's uh, and how it relates to especially our mental health or the mental health of, of others, inshallah. So with that, I'll, I'll start with this ayah from the Quran in Surah Baqarah, verse, for one, uh, verse number 45. Allah says, وَاسْتَعِينُوا بِالصَّبْرِ وَالصَّلَاةِ وَإِنَّهَا لَكَبِيرَةٌ إِلَّا عَلَى الْخَاشِعِينَ And seek help through patience and prayer and indeed, it is difficult except for those who are humbly submissive. So subhanAllah, this ayah alone teaches us so much because it's, Allah is telling us, first of all, to seek help. That as Muslims, we do not just sit back and wait for help to come to us. We are the ones who have to go out and seek help. And this concept of isti'ana is literally us doing our part and then Allah doing His part or help coming from somewhere where we do not expect it. But the key there is that we have to take the initiative. It is us who have to take that first step and do something to either get closer to Allah, to get out of our difficulties, and then also seek these means of aid and support, for example, the prayer and patience. And we'll see that both of these go hand in hand because one of the concepts about the prayer is because it's um, separated throughout the day at different times, different durations, and it's, it's something that we have to strive regularly to be patient with in order to be able to do it successfully, inshallah. And aside from just the times of the act of doing it, it itself, 
can be difficult because we have to focus and concentrate during the time when we are praying in order for it to reach its maximum benefit. And uh, the second part of this ayah, Allah says, وَإِنَّهَا لَكَبِيرَةٌ إِلَّا عَلَى الْخَاشِعِينَ And this is something very difficult except for those who are humbly submissive. So alhamdulillah, there's, uh, you can see a dichotomy here, the way this is mentioned. But on one side, we have to realize that we have to seek help through this concept of patience and the prayer. But at the same time, we have to recognize that if we are not amongst those people who are humbly submissive, then prayer is something that is going to be difficult for us. But if we are humbly submissive, then prayer will become easier and vice versa. That if we try to uh, condition ourselves to become more patient and to be better in our prayers, as a result of that, Allah's promise will also come true that we will become humble and submissive to Allah and more open to changing ourselves for the better, alhamdulillah. So there's so much goodness just in this concept of prayer and patience is, a, I would say, a subset of that. It, it, it's a part and parcel of it as well. So alhamdulillah, this ayah, inshallah, I'm going to get back to at the end of the talk as well because I can mention it's going to be a very interesting connection there. And what can the prayer offer us? It, in terms of spiritual healing and mental health, it, it should be a component of any mental health development plan. And I, don't, I don't, don't mean this just in a professional context. Even in our own lives, if we're trying to improve ourselves or our family members, anybody else, the prayer should be a focal point for that. And it should be an aspect of it that is important. Meaning that if we're trying to improve certain aspects of our own character or our actions, or activities, knowledge, we should always go back and, and assess what is our relationship with Allah through our prayer. Because if we try to do a, a good job, inshallah, of uh, establishing a connection with Allah and maintaining it, then all the other things that we're trying to do will be easier for us to be patient and endure and learn and spend the time necessary to improve ourselves in those ways as well. And what the prayer offers us is a link with Allah. And in a sense, it is a conditioning, it's a routine that we follow in order to um, you know, maintain that connection with Allah, remind ourselves throughout the day and night when we are maybe busy doing other things like working, studying, sleeping, eating, that we have to take the time out and maintain that connection with Allah. And alhamdulillah, if we look at it from the, uh, a bigger picture context, Allah has blessed us with 24 hours in the day. And out of that 24 hours, Allah is only asking us for about 20 minutes, which is all it would take to do the obligatory prayers and even the wudu tied to that. So Alhamdulillah, the 20 minutes Allah is saying, that is my time, give it to me, remember me, be thankful to me. The other 23 hours and 40 minutes, do whatever you want as long as it is permissible. So Alhamdulillah, it is a blessing and a mercy from Allah that we do not have the obligation to do much more than that. And 20 minutes in the scheme of things out of 24 hours is not much time at all. And I'm talking about 20 minutes throughout the day, not that it's all at one time, just so that nobody misunderstands. It means that if we add up all the times for the five different prayers, the, the fara'id, the five prayers, it'll just add up to maybe 20 minutes at the most. So alhamdulillah, in that sense, it is a conditioning for us. It is also reinforcement of our, of our beliefs. It is a time for us to uh, com uh, contemplate and to think and to reflect on what is going on uh, in our lives. And um, also it is a supplication as well. And I'm going to clarify that a little bit when I talk about the contemplation. It doesn't mean that we get distracted and, and zone out in our prayers and start thinking about everything. But it's in specific parts of the prayer. And the supplication in, as part of this connection and conversation that we have Allah is we have the right to ask Allah for what we wish in our lives. And this could be anything from you know, iman, from knowledge, to even uh, material things and, and, and worldly matters. Alhamdulillah, there's nothing wrong. Allah is the one who can provide for us in all of those ways and we should not feel shy and we should ask Him with conviction for anything that we desire that is from the permissible. And um, if we abstract out of our individual selves and we look at it from the bigger picture from as far as the community is concerned, the prayer also strengthens the bond of the communities. And we see that in our congregational prayers where not only are we encouraged to go into the masajid, especially the men, and to you know, pray as a group, but to stand next to each other and not to have any barriers. And Alhamdulillah, where I live in the West, when visitors come to our mosques and we give them tours, and we explain to them this concept that we all pray together and there's no VIP spot for the clergy, uh, there's a person who leads the prayer, and us, other than that, there's no VIP places, first come, first serve, rich man, poor man, black man, white man, 
a young, old, alhamdulillah, is something very amazing for them to understand and to, to reflect on. And it may be something that we as Muslims may take for granted. So we should be proud of this tradition. We should be grateful for the way Allah has blessed us in making us all equal in His eyes, aside from the righteousness that is within us, not just what we display on the outside. So alhamdulillah, we ask Allah to you know, give us sincerity in our acts of worship and to help us understand these concepts so we can uh, internalize them and inshallah show them to others as well so that they can see the beauty of Islam through the, this, these actions and this character rather than all the things that they are, they are being misled by uh, outside of that. So alhamdulillah it is also the prayer in the congregation is a reminder of the day of judgment. The way we stand together ankle to ankle, shoulder to shoulder lining up is a reminder five times a day that inshallah there will be a time where we will be standing in the same way waiting for our final reckoning waiting for our judgment to be passed and so inshallah if we keep that in mind as we pray our prayers it will help us reorient ourselves five times a day and say you know what I need to do whatever I can between this prayer and the next to make sure that when I am standing in that line on the day of judgment that I am not worried I am not under stress or duress that I have I don't have much to answer for to my Lord and Creator when my turn comes to to be judged so alhamdulillah in that sense it is something beneficial to us in so many different ways not just from the spiritual aspect of completing and fulfilling our obligations but also for the way it um, helps us establish that link with Allah and to create a bond of brotherhood and sisterhood with, throughout our ummah and a reminder of, of the day of judgment and one of the things that we will see as we meet different people in our lives is that those who move away from the prayer yet a sense or a feeling that it's just a ritual, it's just hitting their head on the ground a few times and there's no one really listening and because they try to look and observe at the world around them and they try to judge uh, the our deen of Islam or the prayer or the concept of Allah based on what they're looking at and so people question why are, or is evil happening, why are bad things happening around the world, I mean, why isn't Allah doing more to help and overcome these challenges that Muslims and non-Muslims are facing everywhere. So that's an important question that we as Muslims need to be able to understand and to be able to answer because this is one of those things especially when we look at the youth that is driving them away from the deen is not having good answers to these questions. Why is there evil in the world? Why are innocent people suffering and dying? And the answers are there in our deen. We just have to find them, learn them and be able to explain this to them. So we know from Surah Baqarah for example where Allah tells us, وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِّنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوءِ وَنَقْسٍ مِّنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ That Allah has promised us that He is going to test us with some of these things or all of them. With fear, hunger, loss of wealth, you know, lives of the people we love or are close to, the fruits of our labors. All these things are ways uh, that Allah will test us. It does not necessarily mean that these are punishments, that we've done something wrong to deserve them. But they are, alhamdulillah, for believers, a test and something that is beneficial because on the Day of Judgment, our patience throughout these um, challenges will lead to benefit. And that's what if we go on uh, in these ayahs, we'll see. When, if we say, inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un, it is a reminder to ourselves. We're telling ourselves and validating that whatever difficulty we are facing in our lives or other people are facing in their lives, we all come from Allah. And we are all on this journey going back to Him. And whatever is going on in our lives is a bump in the road. And now that bump in the road could be temporary, it could be very short, it could be medium range, it could be long range, it could be until the end of our lives. But the point is, that even if it continues and persists all the way to the end of our lives, then when we go back to Allah, then Alhamdulillah, we will be the, if we are amongst those who are patient through it, the next verse will come into play where Allah says, that those are the ones who endure these calamities, who recognize that you know, the journey is long and it's going to end to, with Allah, then they will get blessings from Allah and mercy from Allah and they are the ones who are the, the ones who are rightly guided. And we ask Allah to make all of us amongst those, inshaAllah. And also in the last verse of Surah Baqarah, which is we're encouraged to recite every night as per the Sunnah, we have to remember and remind ourselves لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها that Allah would never push anyone beyond his or her limit and this is something uh, from a, a greater perspective it ties into the prayer but just in general psychology of a, a believer is that we go through challenges in our lives and sometimes we feel that there is no hope and we are at the point where you know there's nothing else that we can do and there's no help that's coming and Allah is not listening we shouldn't have those thoughts but sometimes they creep in 
And we have to go back to these verses. That's why every single night the Prophet ﷺ would recite these verses. And they are more for our benefit so that we, when we're lying in bed and all the thoughts are going through our minds, we get comfort and solace in these kinds of messages from Allah that Allah would never push us beyond our limit. He might take us all the way to the limit. He might bring us right to the edge. But He's never going to give us any challenge that is too much for us to bear. So if we think of it in that perspective, we have to remember that any difficulty that we are going through is within our capacity to, to bear. And if we feel otherwise, it may be that we underestimate our own ability to bear burdens rather than feel that Allah is the one pushing us beyond our limits. So Alhamdulillah, with that we also have to remember that anything evil that touches us is not from Allah. Allah is not the one who decrees evil. He will permit it to take place, but He does not decree it of Himself. And we have to know this is part of our belief and our creed as Muslims to understand and internalize this message. And if we do that, it becomes less about blaming Allah for what happens in our lives, but accepting whatever He has decreed and knowing that He is all aware of everything that we do. And inshallah, if we patiently endure, that He will reward us for that as well. And alhamdulillah, there are many verses in the Quran. I'm not going to read the Arabic just for the sake of time. I'll leave these up here. But you can see, in, for example, in Surah Baqarah, Allah says, وَإِذَا سَعَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ that when my servant asks thee about me, say, I am indeed close. I listen to the prayer, the dua of every supplicant when he calls upon me. But there's a condition to that Allah mentions. He says, let them also with a will listen to my call and believe in me that they may walk in the right way. So it's one thing to know that Allah is the one who can answer our duas, He can answer our supplications and to demand things from Him in a positive way. But it's another to also realize that we have a part to play in earning that as well. That we need to listen to Allah to understand what His call is, who we're calling to, and do our part, the bare minimum, even if we do just the bare minimum to earn that response from Allah. Then Alhamdulillah, we will be amongst, inshallah, those who are rightly guided. And we will get the response to our du'as, and we should know this separately, that they come in the form of either the du'a being answered, or from some calamity being uh, kept away from us, or from the reward of being patient for not getting what we asked for on the Day of Judgment. And that ultimately would be more beneficial to us than having some of those du'as answered in our lifetimes as well. So Alhamdulillah, this is uh, just a reminder to show that Allah is always aware, regardless of what we may feel, what we may see happening around the world, and all the accusations people are making about you know, a God who would not intervene when evil is occurring. And we should never ex understand that to mean that Allah is performing the evil, but he is allowing the evil to take place, whether it is in the form of a test or a punishment or whatever the wisdom is behind that, that we are not aware of. And Alhamdulillah, other verses, for example, and I have a, a the reference here is incorrect, it's not in Surah 5, it's actually Surah number 6, Surah Ma'idah, verse 59 and, and verse number 60, that, that has these uh, ayahs where Allah says, with, and with him are the keys of the unseen, none knows them but he, and he knows whatever there is in the land and in the sea. Not a leaf falls, but he knows it. And there is not a grain in the darkness of the earth, nor anything fresh or dry, but it is written in a clear record. So Alhamdulillah, Allah is aware of everything, even our deepest thoughts and feelings he's aware of. And they're all recorded and they'll all be presented to us on the Day of Judgment. So we need to understand that Allah is not some remote, distant being, but someone who is very engaged in our lives and aware of everything. And uh, how the prayer factors into this is based on this hadith Qudsi that's reported by, uh, recorded by Imam Muslim where the Prophet ﷺ says that Allah says that I have divided the prayer into two halves between me and my servant and my servant will receive what he asks for. So inshallah what I hope to achieve through these two slides is if you, when we start our prayers we should remember that this is a dialogue. It is not just us saying things uh, doing some motions and putting our heads on the ground, but it's actually a conversation that we are having Allah that has uh, a response. And to think about the fact that there's 1.6 billion Muslims in the world, and maybe even if a billion of those Muslims are at the age of uh, being able to pray, then alhamdulillah, and every moment there's somebody somewhere is, is performing their prayers. So imagine how active Allah is and engaged Allah is in knowing each and every single one of His servants and responding to them in this way. So when the servant says, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Allah the Most High says, My servant has praised me. And when the servant says, 
Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Allah the Most High says, My servant has glorified me. And when he says, Maliki Yawmiddin, Allah remarks, My servant has glorified me. And then when the servant says, Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'een, Allah says, This is between me and my servant, and my servant will receive what he asks for. Then when the worshipper says, Ihdina sirat al-mustaqeem, sirat al-lazina an'amta alayhim, ghayri al-mazdubi alayhim wala dhalleen. Guide us to the straight path, the path of those upon whom you have bestowed your grace, not the path of those who have incurred your anger, nor of those who have gone astray. And Allah again says, this is for my servant, and my servant will receive what he asks for. As I mentioned, this was reported by, recorded by Imam Muslim. So alhamdulillah, we can see that our prayer that we offer at minimum five times a day is a, a beautiful dialogue with Allah, and one that is an active conversation where He is responding. And when we stand to pray and we recite Surah Fatiha, we should know that every verse that we recite, Allah is listening to, and He is responding to it and answering that. So mashallah, it will help us establish a better connection and a better appreciation for this prayer. And uh, another way to look at that is if we analyze the systems of worship and prayer in other faiths and other uh, belief systems, then we can see that ours stands out so much further than any other one that's out there, alhamdulillah, in terms of the, the way we do it, the fact that we're still reciting in the Arabic language, the original language of the revelation, and uh, the fact that we have an active conversation and there, there's physical movements that have their own benefits, inshallah, we, we'll really uh, enjoy and get to love our prayer even more. And we ask Allah to make us feel comfort in our prayers the way the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to feel uh, that comfort as well. So some of the other benefits, and this is not based on any scientific information, it's just collected information that I have. And I, and I hope someday people will perform a serious study on the prayer and every aspect of it. I've seen small uh, pieces, bits and pieces, but nothing holistic that covers everything from the physical to the psychological to the physiological to all the other benefits that can be out there. So uh, we know, for example, that the different movements in the prayer stimulate various energy centers based on the bending, the bowing, you know, the prostration. It, it also helps us in terms of flexibility. And alhamdulillah, you know, it's something we may not appreciate that the people who pray from a young age throughout their lives, even when they're at the older age, uh, many of them do not need to even sit down to pray. They can continue and maintain that flexibility if they have a overall healthy lifestyle in terms of their uh, diet, exercise, and so forth. It's just much easier for them to continue that and to have good flexibility. It improves circulation uh, as well. People who have jobs where they sit and are uh, you know, sedentary for most of the day, getting up a few times a day just to go and do the prayer helps with the circulation and helps in those situations too. Uh, it's known that this kind of... Um, uh, prayer and supplication can also reduce stress and that is the whole point right for us to go back to Allah and share our problems and our worries and know that there's someone listening to them not only someone listening but someone who can do something about them and we know from the hadith from the Prophet ﷺ where he said that the closest that a servant is to his Lord is when he is prostrating so increase dua so the, the sujood is a time where uh, alhamdulillah we should uh, not just glorify Allah but ask Allah as well. I know in some cultures people are not aware of this or they don't do this as a practice, but we should be prolonging our sujood to the point where we ask Allah for anything that we want in any language that we want so that uh, we can get across what our heart desires inshallah, like uh, from our spiritual beneficial things or it could be material things, whatever it is that we want, we can ask Him in those situations. And Alhamdulillah, this is uh, a blessing for us that when we are putting our heads down and are most humble, that that is when we are closest to our Lord. And that's something that we should try to maximize as much as we can, inshallah. Just a brief case study about uh, this concept of spirituality and prayer and how it influences character. Now, the first revelation, the first word to be revealed for, of, of the Qur'an was iqra, to read, to recite. And the Prophet ﷺ, as we know, was unlettered. That means he could not read or write. And he, he mentioned that that uh, you know I am not one of those uh, who are, are read or write and even though he said that it didn't stop him from alhamdulillah assuming on this responsibility of being the, the protector of the Quran and a prophet of Allah and so on and so forth so he struggled and strived and did whatever he had to do as a messenger in order for his message to the, the message of Allah to be passed on to others and we need to realize this as well that for us our deen 
is not something that is the birthright, it is a privilege, it is an honor that has been bestowed upon us that Allah chose us to be Muslims, whether it was by birth through our families or by finding it through some other means and through Allah's guidance. But Alhamdulillah, it is definitely an honor and a blessing that we have from Allah. So in these verses from Surah Al-Alaq, we um, see some um, amazing revelation here, talking about the psychological aspects of man. I'm not going to read again the Arabic just for the sake of time, but it mentions, for example, in verse 6, No, indeed, man transgresses because he sees himself self-sufficient. So this is a reminder for ourselves that we need to keep that aspect of our egos and our pride in check and, and realize that we should be humble and that is the attribute of good believers. Not to be complacent and to be timid, but to be humble and instead of uh, acting superior and so on and so forth. As opposed to uh, the, the um, I guess the target of this surah, for, uh, part of it, is uh, Abu Jahl, who was quite anti-Islamic in his own right in his time and did everything he could to stop the message of Islam. And this, um, on a side note, is a message for my brothers and sisters. And as we see, there's so much of that kind of activity going on in the world today here in, in the West as well as in other parts of the world. Alhamdulillah, this is not something new. We have to get comfort and um, you know, reconcil reconciliation in the fact that this is not a new problem. It happened at the time of the Prophet Wasallam, and we have to learn how he dealt with it at that time so that we can better deal with it at this time. And one of the side things that I will say here is that as much as we get upset and sometimes even angry and maybe perhaps our, our emotions get the better of us at the times, we have to remember that the Prophet Wasallam used to follow the example, the model that was divine that came from Allah. So when it came to the adversaries and the people who were against him, who wanted to harm him, who wanted to kill him, who wanted to try and stop the message of Islam from being spread, what was his intention behind his interactions with people? His only intention was that they, uh, at the minimum, stop what they were doing to get in the way, or at the maximum, accept Islam and become part of this brotherhood. And we should feel the same way, that the people who are the worst of the worst today in terms of being against Islam, our dua should be Allah guide them as well as us, guide all of us and make them part of our brotherhood, make them see the truth of Islam as opposed to what they are saying. And we can see examples of this, for example, in the brother Anud van Doorn, who is from the Netherlands. He was at one time anti-Islam, he was against us, doing things against the Muslims in terms of the message. And now, alhamdulillah, he's our brother in faith and he's going around the world trying to make up for what he did. And he, there's no place where he goes where he feels unsafe. Whereas if he had gone before, he would have felt in, in his, his life was in danger in many circles. So alhamdulillah, we have to think of it that, in that way, that everyone we see around us, even though they may not be um, positive in terms of their view of Islam, are all potential Muslims. They're all potential brothers and sisters and we need to try to be compassionate and merciful and try to think and see the truth about Islam. So when it comes to Abu Jahl, we see Allah saying to him, have you seen the one who forbids a servant when he prays? Have you seen if he is upon guidance or enjoins righteousness? Have you seen if he denies and turns away? Does he not know that Allah sees? No, if he does not desist, we will surely drag him by the forelock. And this is important, alhamdulillah, because we know what happened to Abu Jahl. We know his end. When these verses were revealed, Allah knew what his end was going to be. And even then, the message here is no, if he does not desist, if he doesn't stop what he's doing, if he doesn't turn around, if he doesn't give up this path of resisting you know, the message of Islam and trying to do evil against the believers, then we're going to capture him and we're going to punish him. So, and we see this consistently in the Quran, even with the with Fir'aun, that even though Allah knew what was going to happen, Fir'aun was the worst tyrant of his time, even then Allah was telling Musa salam and Harun salam to go and give him an advice and to be lenient with him and to speak good words to him that perhaps, perhaps he may turn around and stop what he's doing and we know that he did not. And the same thing with Abu Jahl as well. Allah still gave him an out saying if he does not desist, that means there was an opportunity for him to stop and to turn around. And if he doesn't, then we will drag him by the forelock, a lying sinful forelock or forehead. And then Allah continues saying, let him call his associates, we will call the angels of hell. And then Allah says to the Prophet ﷺ, giving him a message, no, do not obey him. But, wasjud waqtarib, that do sajda and get closer to Allah. Alhamdulillah, it's such a comforting ayah, this last one, because Allah is giving the Prophet ﷺ advice in his situation of such extreme adversity, 
to just do sujood and come closer to me. And we know from the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that that is the way to draw close to Allah is uh, to be in the sajda. And Alhamdulillah, this is beautiful. Going back to the ayah about we will drag him by the forelock, a lying sinful forelock. This is something, again, I wish uh, more Muslim um, scientists would study the concept of this forehead because it's translated in different ways, whether it's forelock, forehead, forelobe. Uh, it's usually assumed nowadays to be the frontal part of the brain. And we know from scientific studies, from secular studies, that that is a part of the brain that controls uh, some cognitive functions and also um, the propensity to, to do evil or to not stop ourselves from doing evil can be affected by that part of the brain. And I was at a recent lecture where there was a clinical psychologist talking about this from a secular perspective. And he put up uh, this slide showing the brain scans of a normal person and a psychopath. And he said specifically that the psychopaths have a deficiency in the frontal part of, uh, of their brain. In this blue area that you can see that's, uh, that's tied there, there's a deficiency there or some sort of a harm and injury that has happened there. And alhamdulillah, when we look at this in our context, that five times a day at the minimum, Muslims, we simulate that part of the brain. We, we prostrate on the ground and we let the blood flow there. And if indeed this advice to prolong the sujood and to say dua and to do all those things, if, if that is not just part of our worship, but it has this psychological benefit of stimulating this part of the brain that will prevent us from doing harmful things or, or evil things, that is, alhamdulillah, an extra benefit and a bonus. And uh, perhaps it may be one way that people can change from uh, displaying this psychopathic behavior and having those tendencies to being better and, and more calm and in control of, of their actions as well. So alhamdulillah, and I wish, uh, again, there's more studies about this, and perhaps there are, and I'm not aware of them, uh, but I wish this is something that we'd be able to understand because it is something that our deen comes with, it's built into it, and not something that we had to add on for the benefit. So um, going on to the subject, the title of my uh, presentation was Mindfulness Meditation, because this is a concept that even though the origins of it are from you know, thousands of years ago, it's gaining popularity in terms of a lifestyle choice. And I wanted to show you what mindfulness meditation is. And this is one st uh, statement that says, the present study provides an initial indication that brief mindfulness meditation training buffers self-reported psychological stress reactivity, but also increases cortisol reactivity to social uh, evaluative stress. And the researchers wrote, this pattern may indicate that initially brief mindfulness meditation training fosters greater active coping efforts, resulting in reduced the psychological stress appraisals and greater cortisol reactivity during social evaluative stressors. In summary, it's very technical, even I don't understand what all those words mean. In summary, what it means is, sajda is good for you. So alhamdulillah, it's saying that this concept of mindful, mindfulness meditation, which is actually our entire prayer, because how is this different from regular meditation? Meditation just means that you zone everything out and you just let your mind wander. Mindfulness means that we're actually alert, focused, active, thinking, contemplating, and realizing what it is that we're doing. So in our prayer, we have all of those things, alhamdulillah. So we've been doing this mindfulness meditation for the past 1400 years. And if we do it right, it can really help us and improve us in so many different ways. Not just in terms of our closeness to Allah, but it also in, uh, in a way of controlling us and our desires, but also um, from the physical aspects and from stress relief. So alhamdulillah, there's so many different things that, uh, that we get out of this. Another um, statement about uh, this is that evidence from these studies supports the notion that being mindful, being aware of the present moment without grasping onto judgment does indeed improve immune function enhance the sense of equanimity and clarity, and may even increase empathy and relational satisfaction. Alhamdulillah, our prayer is the relationship between us and Allah, but if we're in that sujood, we humble ourselves, you know, we understand our place in the scheme of things with Allah, with uh, His Prophet وسلم, with Islam, with our families and the people around us, it makes us reflect on our lives in a better way, and inshallah as a result of that, we will be better people as a result of it if we, if we do this the right way. Mindfulness training and neural integration, well, this is the study that was used where this uh, came from. So alhamdulillah, just uh, some more information about that. Um, beyond its use in reducing depressive acuity, research additionally supports the effectiveness of mindfulness meditation upon reducing cravings of substances. 
that people are addicted to. Addiction is known to involve the weakening of the prefrontal cortex, the same frontal part of the brain, that ordinarily allows for delaying of immediate gratification for longer term benefits by the limbic and paralimbic brain regions. SubhanAllah, this is what our aqidah really is, that we deprive ourselves of those desires they may not, that may not be lawful in this life for the long-term benefit of the, the things, the blessings we will get in the next life. So this is amazing that secular medicine and science are showing us uh, the same from uh, you know, this concept of mindfulness meditation, which we call prayer. Mindfulness meditation of smokers over a two-week period, totaling five hours of meditation, decreased smoking by about 60% and reduced their cravings, even for those smokers in the experiment who had no prior intention to quit. SubhanAllah. It shows that if we embark on this endeavor, whatever we're trying to achieve can become easier, even if they may not be our primary goal. We start that effort, we start the prayer, we start contemplating, then inshallah we will see the side effects of it. That's why going back to the earlier aspects that, uh, the point that I mentioned, that uh, prayer should become a, a central component to any development plan. Because if we go back to the prayer, then inshallah we'll see the other things work themselves out because as we get closer to Allah, we want to do nothing more than to please Him, to make Him happier. We want to avoid those things that would make Him unhappy and would come back and, and harm us in the future as well. And finally in the this, in this statement it says, neuroimaging of those who practice mindfulness meditation has been shown to increase activity in the prefrontal cortex, a sign of greater self-control. So alhamdulillah, you know, our religion teaches us that we don't need other people to validate and to confirm what, what it teaches. We have belief in Allah, and if we have that belief, then we understand and know that whatever we have been taught in the Qur'an and in the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ is beneficial to us, whether we like it or not. We have to accept it as Muslims, whether we follow it or we like it, that's between us and Allah, we have to make sure we, we have the ability to answer to Him for that. But Alhamdulillah, now we can see that science is proving out what uh, our system of worship, worship already includes. And this last statement, you know, if we think about this from this, the point of everything that has been mentioned and also those images that were shown, goes back to this simple concept. So if we keep this ayah in mind, as well as all the things that we've seen so far in this presentation, Alhamdulillah, inshallah, we will have a newfound appreciation for our prayer and how important it is, and we will realize why Allah has commanded us to pray in the way that we pray. One final point that I will make, and this is the end of my presentation, is that when we again compare our practice to others, and we can see what, uh, why the differences are so profound. When we pray our congregational prayers, for example in Jum'ah, uh, or even our prayers, we're not allowed to interrupt them to have conversation, to answer our phones, to get distracted, and we pray them with a, a, a good, humble manner. We have segregation between the genders. All these things are there to help and to maintain the integrity of that worship. And we can see the beauty of that when we look at what other people have done with their uh, practices and their worship. They have become so diluted because of all the distractions from the technology, from uh, m making ease in it, the fact that they don't use the original languages even. So, so many things have crept in that have destroyed the integrity of their forms of worship, whereas for us it has been maintained for 1400 years. And if we recognize the value in that and we instill this on our children and our community members, inshallah we will be able to preserve that, that, that beauty of our worship and to maintain its, its integrity uh, you know, for a long time to come, inshallah. And with that uh, I ask you, you to say dua for all those who have participated uh, you know, in, in these events, inshallah, whether attending or organizing or presenting and to uh, you know, forgive us for any mistakes that we have made and um, you know, to ask Allah to guide all of us inshallah. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم سبحانك الله وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك. If you have any questions inshallah I'll be willing to help answer them inshallah. Alhamdulillah the, for the person who asked about the, the topic uh, mindfulness meditation the whole point of this um, talk was to show our prayer as being mindfulness meditation. So I left the just the last aspects about the benefits of mindfulness meditation because if you can go look up what that means and there's different definitions of it depending on who's talking about mindfulness meditation but the point I was trying to get across is that our salah, our prayer is mindfulness meditation that is exactly what we do and uh, alhamdulillah it's already been built into our, our faith.
we don't have to go out and learn about it separately. But in terms of definition, all it really is is a way to meditate and to calm down and to contemplate and reflect without being judgmental on others, but also being focused during that meditation, as opposed to the other forms of meditation that are just you know, doing nothing, basically. Other types of meditation, uh, I'm not sure what that means. I mean, for us, we, we don't really focus on the meditation. Like I said, it's a part and an aspect of our prayer. But, um, you know, if we think about it, if we do things like itikaf, that's a kind of meditation. If we're doing tahajjud, uh, those are all forms of it as well. I mean, there are times or situations for us to contemplate and think and to ask and to supplicate. Uh, there, I mean, you, you could say that Meditation itself is built into many different aspects of our of our worship and our way of life, but not in the secular sense, if that's the intention here. Uh, Alhamdulillah, we have to recognize that waswasa is something that is not unique to us. It happened to people better than us. It happened to the Prophet Wasallam. So we have to know that when it did happen, what did they do? And we know, for example, from the Sunnah is to and turn to our left, uh, say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem, and spit three times dryly to our left. And so there, there are ways to condition ourselves out of the waswasa. And the other aspect of this is to gain knowledge. And if you can hear so many lectures about this, when people talk about the prayer, the, the concept is, let's try to learn the Arabic as much as we can. Let's learn the tafsir of the verses that we are reciting, so that when we are reciting them, we can focus on the meaning of what we're saying, rather than just... Um, saying it out as part of conditioning and just repetition. So if we do that, then inshallah we won't have time to be distracted because we will be focused on what we're doing, and that is part of that mindfulness. Uh, if you know, and if we can't do that, then you know, maybe we need to get some help and get others to help us, uh, whether it's uh, our friends and family or professionals, to help us get over anything that we're getting in terms of what's Right. So the target audience for this presentation was not for just for people who are on the extreme level in terms of mental health issues. This is for anybody. All of us go through um, you know, issues in our lives, and you know, we have to try and find ways out of them. So even for those who are not at the extreme level where they need to get professional help, uh, we all need to get uh, a way to focus ourselves, our energies, our emotions. And one of the best ways to do that is our prayer. So if we're having difficulties in our homes with our spouses or our children, uh, relatives, family members, neighbors, whoever it is, then we need to know that the prayer is always there as an avenue for us to calm down, to relax, to turn to Allah, ask Him for help. And if we do that, inshallah, then it will cut down some of those reactive situations where our emotions get the better of us and we do things that we would end up regretting later on. So this is, uh, as I mentioned, not just for one extreme of the scale, but for everybody on it, from the people who have no problems to the ones who have extreme problems. So for those who are on the side where they need treatment, then, alhamdulillah, we need to um, separate between those who have the ability to do this and those who do not. So someone who is incapable of doing it because of uh, mental issues, then that is different. Their judgment is separate. So uh, for the most part, it is the audience for this is those who have some ability to get the prayer incorporated into their lives. That's a tough question uh, about... Um, Muslims being tortured, I'm not sure what that means, what that's based on by detention in the West. People who are detained in the West have a lot of rights, and in some cases they have more rights than people in Muslim countries who are detained. Uh, I used to work, volunteer work at a prison giving khutbahs there, and alhamdulillah, the prison reached out to our masjid to ask for someone to come and lead the prayers, and they used to get even the maximum security prisoners, just you know, spend 10 minutes just to get them down for the prayer. So there might be instances of that. So uh, just to use terms like commonly done in detention by the West, uh, it's unfair. and It needs to be explained properly. Um, so I'm not sure what kind of torture we're talking about here. Um, so if you want to write about that, I'd appreciate that explanation. But in general, if someone is in that kind of an extreme situation, where else can you turn to accept Allah? And we know from the example of uh, Prophet Yusuf, السلام, he was put in prison for something he did not even do. But he realized this was Allah's decree. And if there was no way for him to get out of it in that situation, he turned to Allah and he prayed to him and he, he tried to teach that message to others. And alhamdulillah, even though we shouldn't be proud of the fact that we have Muslims who are in detention in the West, we also know that Islam is spreading in those detention centers. Because when people have nothing better to do than to learn, they reflect on their purpose in life and what, what they should be doing. And some of them actually uh, do research and find Islam as a result of that. 
so this question, I guess, is more for a professional. Uh, I don't think the salah can be used as a, a, a cure, but it is part, as I mentioned, of a treatment plan. So if it's a mania, something that is in the realm of medical science that we need to have medical professionals deal with, our job should be to go to the people of knowledge and get the help that we need. We can't just say that, okay, we just pray and read Quran, everything is going to be okay. That is not a one-size-fits-all type of treatment that we have in Islam. We have to turn to those who are professional, those who have knowledge. And as we know, our, our Prophet ﷺ said that we need to go out and seek cures. If, for every disease that Allah has sent, He has also sent the cure. So we should go and get the treatment, find that whether it is in just being more spiritual or whether it has crossed a particular threshold and now it gets into needing professional help and then com com uh, complementing that with spirituality as well. Yes, so Guantanamo Bay, is, as far as the U.S. is concerned, outside of the country, it's a separate military camp and Abu Ghraib, as you know, is in Iraq. So those are exceptions to the norm. And uh, I would encourage everyone who, who makes those kinds of comments, you should do your research and find out what you're saying before you make any accusations. The last thing we want is to have to answer for things that we say that are inaccurate and have to answer to Allah, especially on a public forum, if we're not absolutely sure what we're talking about. So when it comes to those military situations, that is separate. I really don't have much knowledge of that. It's uh, Most of the public are, are in dark about what happens there. But if you talk about the public prison system, we can definitely talk about that because there's a lot that's going on, and as I mentioned, in the local prisons here, they reached out to us. We didn't even go to them. They came to us asking for help, asking for Qurans, asking for someone to come and teach about Islam to the Muslims. Even the non-Muslims were allowed to come there and join our Jum'ah prayer and, and benefit from that as well. So Alhamdulillah, we should be careful about that. And there, there may be exceptions to that, and there may be systems, prison systems where they are not as welcoming or they are doing uh, incorrect things but that goes against the rights of those Muslim prisoners. The rights of Muslims are protected in this country at least, in a lot of the Western countries. Alhamdulillah, this is a, now getting into a fiqh type question. Um, I, valid uh, med meditation is in the sense of an Islamic. All I will tell you is it is not consistent with the, the type of meditation that we talk about based on the Quran and Sunnah. It is not something that the Prophet ﷺ ever did in his lifetime or that his companions did. And if we accept that they are the best teachers for us and the Prophet ﷺ is the best of guides, then we have to know that we do not need to do anything beyond what he brought in terms of uh, you know, actions that would benefit us. So if it's someone is banging their head because they want to bang their head and just you know, move their heads up and down for, for no reason, you know, that's not here nor there. But if they're doing it as part of a religious observance, then if it's not based on the teachings of the Quran and Sunnah, we have to question whether there really is any benefit in that. And Alhamdulillah, what I would say, rather than looking at it and saying, is it valid or invalid, I would say, why not focus on those things that we do have that are very clear in the Quran and Sunnah and focus on those and just do that because I think we can occupy our entire lives just doing those things without having to go beyond them and looking at what other people, other groups are doing. So that's my diplomatic answer to that question. Alhamdulillah, this is a fiqh question as well, better suited for someone from your local community who can answer that. But I can tell you in general, if you make mistakes, there's different responses to that, and you can study about this as well. Um, and if it's about forgetting, for example, then go back to whatever you know. Do not start all over again. This is one of the things our religion, the psychology of our faith, we try to avoid behaviors like OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, instead of starting from scratch, we continue from wherever we are absolutely certain. So we're, if we're praying Zuhr and we've prayed three rakahs, but we can't remember and we think we've prayed one at, at minimum, then we go back and add from one, two, three. Even if we end up praying six, seven, eight rakahs at the end of it, what matters is whatever we have certainty about. And for making mistakes, there's ways to compensate for that depending on the type of mistake, and that is something we have to study and know. It's, it's the 101 of our faith, because some mistakes, you can do just such that at the end and that compensate for it. Other mistakes require us to start all over again. So we need to make sure as Muslims we understand what those rules are. It's a good question. Uh, Alhamdulillah, that is, um, if they're in a severe stage of depression, I think there's no better help that we can provide them is to, uh, than to get them to a professional who can get them through that. Of course, we can complement the professional help from uh, by giving them uplifting information, by you know, taking them with us when we go to pray and to tell them that you know, when you're doing sujood that 
Allah is listening to you, so don't feel that you're, you're all on your own. But we have to first get them to professionals who can do a proper treatment plan and get them uh, the, what they need, whether it's guidance, medication, any other form of treatment that's needed. We have to do that first and for severe stages of depression. Alhamdulillah, I saw this question in the chat and I was going to answer it. This is a very, very important subject for two reasons. Because people have gone to two opposite extremes in this situation. And wallahi, our religion is the religion of the middle ground. We try to have a balance between everything. Because even here in the West, when people come from different cultures, we have people who don't make the proper rows in the prayer. And there are those who try to enforce that and force everyone to make the, the proper rows in the prayer. And both of those extremes are, are not appropriate. The person leading the prayer should call the congregants to make sure that they are together and they're, they're responsible for making sure the message is out there and they try to do that. After that, it is up to the individuals to make sure they understand what their requirements are. So we have two categories of people, at least here. One are those who will make the row straight, they will try to make sure they're, they're touching the people next to them. And then the other group is those who just want to get away from everybody and, and not touch anyone, just because that's how they have been brought up and that's what their tradition teaches them. I'm not saying it's correct. But what is incorrect is when uh, the first group try to you know, do splits just to have a connection with the person next to them, and the other extreme is the person who doesn't want to touch just keeps moving further and further and further away until they're all bunched up in, in a knot. And both of those are incorrect. Our job in the prayer is to worship Allah and to do what is obligated upon us. So if we have done our best and we start the prayer, we need to move on and have kushu and focus on the prayer and not on the stuff or anything of that sort. At the beginning of the prayer, yes, the making the rows is important and we need to make sure we maintain that. But after that, we need to focus on the prayer and not worry about what people next to us are doing. At the same time, it is incumbent on the masajid, on the imams to teach their communities the importance of maintaining the rows because just like this question says, it's not just about increasing iman and mindfulness. The Prophet ﷺ was so specific. He said that do not leave gaps, otherwise Satan will enter and sow dissension in your hearts. And we see this in the world around us. How many of us come from communities where you know, we are better than the other Muslims because of the flag that we live under or because of this aspect or because of our wealth or our status or our lineage. We have found so many excuses to, to differentiate us from others. Whereas the, the, our religion teaches us that there's no difference between believers except for their righteousness, that taqwa that, that they have. And if we remember that, then our flags, our lineage, our wealth, all of that will be meaningless when it comes to judging other people and we will have no problem having physical contact with the person next to us. So yes, we need to be like those bricks in the wall uh, to be together and to support each other. But at the same time, if someone does not want to be part of that, we cannot enforce that and force them and, and say things about them in a negative way to, to turn them away even further. We have to get educated on both sides, inshallah. That's a good question. I don't see any questions coming up, so I'll just answer this one that talks about OCD and take wudu. Alhamdulillah, that's a tough one because sometimes people take a long time to do wudu just because they keep forgetting what they've done, what they haven't done. There's two things I will say there. One is for us to get help when we need to. So if we feel that we're amongst those who have that compulsive disorder and we're just repeating over and over again all those steps, then on one side we should get someone to come with us who watches and observes and corrects us if we are going crossing the line. On the other side, it is also important for us to learn this aspect of the sunnah and how to do wudu. And many of us may not even be aware that the Prophet ﷺ used to do wudu, full wudu, with one cup of water. And this, alhamdulillah, is a mercy in our religion. We know the best gift that we can give to anyone is water. And what is better for us to internalize this and say, you know what, I am going to start doing wudu with the bare minimum amount of water possible so that I can save the other water that I would have wasted for the future generations to come. So if we keep that in mind, then alhamdulillah, we will be mindful. Every time we're about to do wudu, we'll say, you know what, I'm only going to use a cup of water. I'm not going to let the tap run. I'll put water in a cup, and I'm going to do wudu with that. And trust me, we have done a demonstration in our masjid. Our youth group did that. We were able to do wudu with less than a cup of water. If you do every step just one time, three is the sunnah, one is the minimum. If you do that, then you can use less than a cup of water to do an entire wudu with water dripping off your body, alhamdulillah. So, Learn that, and inshallah, it'll take away some of the aspects of the OCD. Plus, if you bring help, then they can help you overcome uh, forgetfulness without not realizing how much uh, you've done certain things.
This is also a very difficult question to answer. It really depends on the situation, depends on the person we're going to. It, it varies based on the gender, the dean of the person. So we have to be careful that there are certain things that we can share and certain things that we cannot. As individuals, we have to be able to assess what are those things that would be beneficial for the treatment and what are the things that the, the person who's treating me does not even need to know about in terms of, of the private life. But in secular environments, obviously, it's very difficult so when we're dealing with non-Muslims. They're not usually aware of some of these sensitivities, and they will ask questions. But if we're talking about Muslims, then, you know, inshallah, if they're good practicing Muslims, they will know what those boundaries are and not cross them. At the end of the day, the primary objective is to get treatment. And if getting treatment means we're going to a place where somebody may not understand the sensitivities of Islam, and we have to cross certain boundaries in order to get that treatment, the treatment is the bigger goal, and that is my view. I mean, inshallah, we can. There's so much research that can be done on this, and there's nuances to this. But the at the end of the the, goal, the end goal, as I mentioned, is to get treated for those conditions, inshallah. Well, there's different ways and different uh, forms of getting this, into this meditative or mindful phase, and some people have different kinds of triggers that lead to it. But uh, I think. Uh, tying it to some physical activity helps because part of the mindfulness and um, you know psychological meditation is tied to physically being uh, stress free or in a reduced stress kind of environment. So if you're doing stretching, breathing, all those kinds of things that even maybe you know from secular systems, Alhamdulillah, that can help us get to that state where we are more mindful and contemplative. So I, I want to make it clear that I'm not saying that. The only way we can meditate and to be mindful and contemplate is the prayer. But my point is that the prayer already has all of that built into it. If we find other ways of doing it, alhamdulillah, whatever it is to bring us down to a lower level of uh, you know, emotional state and activity and to make us more contemplative, that's what we need to do. For some it may be tea and coffee, um, and that's nothing wrong with that. For some it may be smoking, which is not good, right? That is something that is harmful and not appropriate to get into that meditative phase, even though some may argue that, hey, that's how I get relaxed. So we have to understand that the, the means used to achieve good have to be good themselves. They cannot be evil means. And when it comes to yoga, if we're talking about the physical motions of yoga, then perhaps there's some goodness in those. But if we're talking about the religious aspects of yoga, we have to understand what those are as Muslims and avoid those because they are not part of our, our way of life and our, our deen. So we have to be cognizant of those as well. I mentioned this earlier, so what the Prophet ﷺ advised us to do if there's a negative thought is to um, seek refuge in Allah, say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajeem. You turn to your left and spit dryly three times, just a, like a sound, like a th without any spit really coming out. And if we look at this from the psychological perspective, this is called conditioning. Every time that thought comes in our minds, we do this, all of a sudden our focus is back. Alhamdulillah, our prayer is like that too. That's why the motions in our prayer are repetitive we go through them over and over again because they help, they condition us to get focused. We raise our finger when we're sitting down and doing the tashahud. That is part of it too, that we're conditioned to look at those spots. This is why when we pray, we don't wander our eyes all around. We look at the place of sujood because our focus is maintained. If we see our focus slipping, we seek refuge in Allah. We say, A'udhu Billahi Min Shaitan Rajeem. And we keep doing that. And over time, what will happen is that because of this conditioning, or the number of instances of these negative thoughts, negative actions, will keep reducing over time, and inshallah, we'll be able to overcome those difficulties. And as I mentioned, if we're not able to do that on our own, we need to step out and get help and get advice from others. This is something the Prophet ﷺ said, we should not be shy when it comes to the religion. So we can ask difficult questions, we can ask sensitive questions, and we can always turn to others to help us. Because in Islam, the only thing we would ever want, aside from salvation for ourselves, is to help our brothers and sisters to do better and to get to a higher state. We should always be looking out for the benefits of others after ourselves. And with that, inshallah, I think this is the last question. I, I thank you all. Jazakumullah khairan for being here, from, for your patience, and for uh, listening to all of this. And if there's anything that I said that was incorrect, know that that is from me and Shaytan. And anything that is beneficial came from Allah, and we ask Allah to guide all of us. Jazakumullah khairan.